All right, welcome everyone. My name is Jack Barth. I'm the executive director of the Marine Studies Initiative. And I'd like to welcome you on behalf of both MSI, the Marine Studies Initiative, as well as the School of Language, Culture and Society in OSHU's College of Liberal Arts. So the Marine Studies Initiative is promoting a transdisciplinary approach to ensuring a healthy future for our ocean and really for the planet because the ocean is so important to our planet. We're excited to have just launched a new undergraduate degree in marine studies that emphasizes that connection of the natural and social sciences and the arts and humanities, all looking at the human dimensions of the oceans and coasts. So that's just a perfect background for today's webinar and we're happy you're joining us uh, as we look at another transdisciplinary problem. And so uh, we'll be talking about the search for Oregon's lost coast. We'll have a keynote uh, presentation. Uh, we'll first introduce our panel. After our keynote uh, talk, we'll have short presentations by each of the panelists. And then we're really excited for the question and answer period with all of you. So we're gonna welcome your input in the back and forth. So with that, I'd like to introduce Virginia Nalen, who will talk us through uh, how the webinar is gonna go. Thank you, Jack. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you again for attending this afternoon. Um, as Jack mentioned, uh, towards the end of our program, we're gonna be shifting to a question and answer session. Um, so if you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, uh, you can see a little Q&A icon down there. Um, I encourage you throughout the lecture today to ask questions. Go ahead and type something in and we'll address those towards the end of the program. Uh, there's also an option to um, ask a question anonymously. So you no, don't necessarily have to put your name if you wouldn't, if you wouldn't like to. Um, I'd also like to note that this lecture today is being recorded. Um, so if you'd like to view it again or have friends or colleagues that couldn't make it, the recording will be available on the Marine Studies Initiative uh, YouTube channel in the next few days, and um, we'll have closed captioning available at that time. Any follow-up questions about today's event, uh, please feel free uh, to contact me at virginia.neylon, N-E-Y-L-O-N, at oregonstate.edu, and we'll get back to you. So thanks again, and uh, back to you, Jack. Thanks. So now I'd just like to do an introduction of our keynote speaker, Lauren Davis. I won't go into great depth because I'll say a few more words in just a minute, but Lauren, would you like to introduce yourself and the panelists? Sure. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Lauren Davis. I'm a professor of anthropology at Oregon State University, and I'm an archeologist by training and by profession. And um, I am happy to be joined today with a number of really great panelists. Uh, we're gonna be hearing from Stacy Scott today, and uh, we're gonna be hearing also from Tom Royer and Dave Ball. And um, later on, we'll, we'll get to meet Sam Stone, who's a student also at OSU. Okay, so we'll, do, we'll hear a little bit more from the panelists also as they each have a couple of remarks. So I, I'd just like to say a few more words uh, that we're happy to have Lauren joining us today. As he mentioned, he's a professor of anthropology. He's also the executive director of the Keystone Archaeological Research Fund here at OSU. PhD in anthropology from the University of Alberta. And he and his students study the late Pleistocene archaeology of the Americas, so things greater than 12,000 years or so ago. Uh, he teaches archaeology classes, including a hands-on field camp, which is a fun thing to do. We've heard great stories come out of that. And he's published extensively on the discovery and study of archaeological sites and evidence of people living in Western North America. Uh, since Really since the the end of the last glacial period is what he's interested in. And he's published uh, extensively, including in science magazines. So some really fun stuff 
So Lauren, I'd like to welcome you to kick off your keynote talk. Thank you. Okay, well, thanks a lot. And so as my computer uh, gets into the share screen mode, um, again, just wanna thank our sponsors today, uh, Marine Studies Initiative, and what I hope to put across today is a discussion that gives you sort of a sense of the different ways in which people can interact with learning about the ocean. And we, at least in the group of people we're gonna talk about, um, or you're gonna hear from today, you know, we come at this problem from some different angles with different interests and different backgrounds also. And uh, at least from my own background, I'm an alumni of Oregon State University and I got a degree in anthropology at OSU. And then I went away to get other degrees and um, I ended up coming back and getting a job also at OSU. So I'm a beaver, but I also have, you know, liberal arts background and training, but yet the things that we'll talk about today are the things that I can do in a transdisciplinary way uh, because of this training. So the title of today's discussion is The Search for Oregon's Lost Coast, Recent Progress and Next Steps. And what I mean by the concept of a lost coast is that when you go and visit the coast today and you stand out and look at the ocean, you know, change is all around you. You see change at you know, momentary uh, lapses of time. You know, minute by minute, the waves come in and go out and come in and go out. But throughout the day, the tides rise and fall. And if we extend this to hundreds to thousands of years ago, the viewpoint that we see right here, for example, in this picture is not the way it was. In fact, sea level was a lot lower than today. And in fact, the modern coastline of Oregon sort of starts to take its shape about 3000 years ago. And as a result, you know, this landscape is constantly uh, in flux. So if you were to pick one place, you know, of Oregon that has sort of mm -hmm. this change, change as normal, then we're basically talking about the coast really in my mind. And from my point of view, you know, I'm interested in looking at questions related to people interacting with this changing coast. So here's a shot of a good friend of mine, Michelle Punk, Dr. Punk is pointing to a layer of shell. And this layer of shell um, dates to a time period after about 3000 years ago. And below it, below this layer of shell, there's also artifacts and the remains of elk uh, that come out of this particular, what we call profile. And this dividing line of where the shell is and where the area below with not shell is sort of an important boundary because what it ends up giving us is this sort of you know, dividing line between people's orientation to the coastal world. And up and down the Oregon coast, you can find shell middens as we call them, these layers of shell like this, they have artifacts in them. You go to an Oregon, state park and they're not, you know, that rare to find on state parks. But what these show us is people's, native peoples of the past living along this coastline, making their living from the ocean's bounty. And what's interesting is that these sites with the have shell in them like this really don't date much before 3000 years ago. So then the question ends up being, you know, what does that mean? Does it mean that people only figured out how to use the coast 3000 years ago, or was there some big change in the ocean maybe before 3000 years ago? And if we're interested in learning a lot about what the coastal archeological record was like, we need to figure out where these sites are. So the answer that gets us closer to figuring out where are these other sites that might date before, let's say 3000 years ago, we need to again, get back to the whole question of how did things change on the Oregon coast. And Oregon being part of, of course, a big, larger, you know, system of our planet. And we can look at the story of how our planet has changed since about 20,000 years ago. So we'll just pick that as a starting point for our big story. And about 20,000 years ago, Earth was in a very different kind of environmental state. We were experiencing a glaciation. So as this map shows us on the upper left, the uh, blue zones that are outlined in red, these are areas that had a lot of glacial ice in them. And so as we can see, the Southern Hemisphere, what's now Antarctica, you know, Antarctica today is a much smaller version of what once was a huge ice cap on the South part of the planet. 
And toward the northern end, we have really big continental glaciers, including North America's glacial ice sheets that at 20,000 years ago connected us to Greenland. So to make ice this size, you have to have a source of water. And that water comes out of the ocean. So as vapor comes off the ocean, condenses into clouds, moves inland, and then drops its precipitation in an ice age, mostly in the form of snow on the landscape, this snow doesn't really return to the ocean very much during a glacial period. It's so cold, the snow just keeps accumulating and compresses and makes ice. So basically what ends up happening is we get much lower sea levels during glacial periods because the water budget's coming out of the ocean, as I mentioned. So this map in the upper left also shows you um, just sort of relative contour uh, differences in uh, the landscape. On the right-hand side, what's important to look at here is this is what we call the relative sea level history for Oregon's central coast. And this is work that was done by an alumna of ours uh, at Morgan State, Jory Clark. She published this paper in 2014 and the blue line is what's important. And on the left-hand side, this is relative sea level compared to today. Today would be zero. At the bottom, these are thousands of years ago. So just add three zeros behind each one. So 20,000 to today, zero. And what we can see is that Jory Clark and colleagues have worked out for us, depending on what time period you're interested in, you can predict, predict where shorelines should be. And when we say relative sea level, what we mean is it's the solution of the problem of how water was returned to the ocean from these ice sheets at the end of the last ice age, also taking into account how the Earth's crust is deforming and moving up and down vertically in relation to the unloading and loading of the landscape with ice. And so you can imagine an ice sheet like this was really heavy. So it distorts and changes the elevation of the uh, landscape around it. So, so this is the solution on the right. So this is the information we need to make you know, an answer about questions of, well, how did the landscape change? And may this have something to do with the reason why we can't find early sites on the Oregon coast. Well, so if we ask this question, you know, where are these sites older than 3,000 years ago on the Oregon coast? If these shell middens are really only that old, well, where are they? Well, they're out here. That is, they're out to the west. They're out in this landscape that once was high and dry, that's now been submerged by rising sea levels at the end of the last ice age. So that's really sort of the beginning of our story, trying to get this idea in mind. So in 2016, I started on a big project um, working in collaboration with the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, the US government, and also with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Office of Ocean Exploration and Research. And between those two groups, um, we started on a, a big project to try to understand, one, what was this landscape like offshore? And could we then also make predictions about where archaeological sites could be offshore of Oregon's central coast. So this is a shot of us working on, on the southern end of the town of Bandon. You know, it's a pretty nice office to be working in. We'll actually be returning here this summer to do uh, work later on in the summer to do renew our excavations there to try to address questions of how long people have been at this site. So the first thing we had to do as part of our big project to understand where people might have been, where these archeological sites could be offshore, would be to reconstruct this lost coast. So uh, basically at the bottom um, of this, you can see the, the latitude and longitude, uh, sorry, latitudes up the right, longitude on the bottom part showing us the distances, but essentially Oregon had about 35 extra miles of coastline during the last glacial period. So from 20,000 years ago all the way today, we have projected where these shorelines could be because we used Jory Clark's model uh, and basically said at these different time periods, this is where we expect a shoreline should be. We used a computer program that helped us draw these contours because there's a lot of information that exists about the elevation of the continental shelf on the edge of Oregon. So that's the first step. We had to know where this landscape would be. And what's amazing to me in this is that look how the landscape changes. So you can see that early on, there's this big projection that goes out, but then as sea level rises from 20,000 years toward 12,000 years, 
we started to develop this really large bay system on the southern part of this landform. So it'd be west of uh, the town of Florence today. And we don't have large embayments like this. I mean, this bay is larger than San Diego Bay. It's smaller than San Francisco Bay, but it's just enormous. Quickly though, after 12,000 years ago, the landscape starts to break up again. And you get into essentially what will become a straight coast. By 9,000 years, Oregon starts to approximate you know, its modern coast. It just starts to creep inward from 9,000 years ago. The second thing we had to do once we understood where this coastline was through time, we had to make predictions about where people might have been on the coast. So this model on the right uses the elevation model of the ancient landscape, the lost coast landscape. And in it, we just divide up the landscape into these 100 meter grid cells. And so if we say, any square, any grid cell on this map landscape, where does it fall? And would it have been in a place that's really great for humans to hang out? So we give the landscape scores. That is, we say, if you're close to water, you get an increased score. If you are on a south facing slope, that's good. You get more of a score. If you were on a flat piece of the landscape rather than a really steep cliff, well, that's even better. And the best of all would be where fresh water comes in and meets the ocean. So we're in estuary forms, we would give it the highest score of all. So this model basically shows that as, as sea level is coming up, the areas that are coated in red are really the best places to hang out. And what we mean by this is we just think that it would have been the areas that offered the most calories per square meter. That is, there's more resources to be found in estuary zones and places like this than any other part of the coast. And so as people have the incentive to use lots of resources in these special places, they would have stayed in one place longer and made a bigger mess in a sense. That is, deposited more shells, maybe um, left behind more artifacts, basically producing a pattern that's more useful for us to find their presence and make bigger archeological sites. So this is a way for us to divide up this enormous ancient landscape and figure out where zones of real high potential could be. So using these models, we were able to move forward then to the next phases. And that was step three, to be able to go out offshore and what we say, ground truth these models. And by ground truthing the models, what we really uh, are looking to do is get better information about the shape of the seafloor where we need to, but also be able to see into the seafloor. We want to see what's down there. Are there layers that we might find and, and what might they mean in relation to the way that this landscape once was. So we used, we started out actually using OSU's uh, research vessel, the Pacific Storm, and then we moved on to using other vessels again that I'll, that I'll show you. But the next stage in this is once we get some targets based on our geophysical survey, we would then put cores into the seafloor. We would try to pull up examples of these different layers we see in the geophysics and relate them to things that maybe ancient landscape pieces, and maybe, if we're really lucky, we might even find archeological evidence within these cores. On the right-hand side is an example of one of these cores. This is taken at a site near Florence, near Takenich Lake, above sea level. And you can see in here, there's a dune sand on top with a forest soil developed in it. In the middle is a layer of shell. And this is from an archeological site that we knew about already. But below that, it's sitting on another ancient surface, an ancient soil down here. So this is the, these are the kinds of things we're looking for offshore. And so we already had some ideas in mind what to be looking for, but we weren't really sure until we got started. So what we had to do over a series of years were a whole bunch of different field projects, but offshore. So usually archeologists you know, are out working in small groups with uh, shovels and trowels and buckets. Well, we had to use different tools to get this job done. So we began with uh, using the Pacific Storm, you, doing sonar and seismic surveys. So we mapped the seafloor and see into the seafloor. We then did a, a cruise on the uh, exploration vessel Nautilus, which is uh, owned by Bob Ballard of Titanic fame. And we did sonar and seismic surveys, but we also did remotely operated vehicle dives to get more of a first person, so to speak, view through the cameras of the, the ROV. Lastly, once we were able to get a lot of information from these other cruises, 
We then had targets that we were interested to explore with coring, but we had to then use a different vessel. We used the Roger Ravel, which comes out of Scripps Institution. And uh, we did fiber coring off the, the uh, back of this vessel. And what's important about this vessel is that it has uh, computer controlled thrusters that allow it to sit in one spot. So if you tell the computer, I wanna sample this one, you know, 10 meters square on the seafloor, it will sit you there you know, and not move around even when the waves are moving. So we needed these special tools to do our job. So we went offshore, we established zones. We were interested in doing survey. These boxes show areas where we drove the ship back and forth like mowing the lawn in different directions. And we dragged around instruments and could see the seafloor and see into the seafloor. And as a result of this, these are some of the images I wanna share with you that are some interesting patterns. So when we started, we didn't really know if we were going to actually see anything uh, that was preserved because we had been told over and over again that as sea level came up, the action of the waves was too dynamic. It would have just chewed up all this ancient landscape and any sites in there, there'd be nothing for us left. It just would have, you know, rototilled the whole thing all the way down to bedrock perhaps. Well, you know, there wasn't a lot of hard evidence to tell us that was going to be true. That was just sort of an educated guess by people. So we were pleased to see as we went forward that we actually could find evidence of things like river channels having cut into the surface of the continental shelf and filling in. So this at the top is what we call sub-bottom profiler data. So seismic waves get sent into the seafloor. They reflect back at different speeds depending on the density of the sea of the material underneath here and allows us to map. So there are parts where there's definitely bedrock projecting up, but there's also softer parts that are horizontally layered that show us that a river had passed through here and left behind deposits. Okay, so the very bottom one here shows us another transect and this goes across the uh, Umpqua River. And basically it shows us where the river had swung over, cut into the, to the continental shelf and left behind a whole bunch of layered deposits. So these are the kinds of things we were looking for because they show us that there's an ancient landscape that relates to time before sea level came up. And that's really critical for us. Based on this, remember how I said we mowed the lawn? Well, these are panels of these different transects that we followed and we reconstruct them you know, where's the bedrock? That's the gray part. And the blue part shows us the parts that are essentially where the streams may have cut and filled in, laying behind deposits that relate to this ancient uh, lost coast. The dashed lines in this are just showing the boundaries between parts that are, we think, probably bedrock sticking up and the parts around them that represent the main Umqua paleo channel that would have been flowing around these rock projections and leaving behind these channels. So we have a lot of data, we can reconstruct things in 3D and it allows us to focus on where we need to go. So I just wanna show you an example. So we pick a part of our landscape model where it suggests that we should be finding the shoreline at the left at 14,000 years ago. And on the right, this is 13,000 years ago. So there's a pretty big change between these two parts of the landscape. And the white dots, are areas where we've actually put marine cores into what we thought were ancient paleo landscape features. So we're gonna focus, I think, on the 13,000 year shoreline next. So we're gonna look at some of these cores. So as we uh, would go out, we'd have the map position. We would tell the captain where to go and park the ship uh, over these targets of interest. And these operations, of course, are 24 hours a day seven days a week, because when you're out there, these ships are very expensive to operate. And we have a small army of people out here working together uh, of all kinds of different uh, transdisciplinary backgrounds. So this was a lot of really, a really great fun project, project to work on, sorry, together. And um, I learned a lot about a lot of different things. So here we are at night, lowering down the vibra core. The vibra core is a, is a motor on top that vibrates intense, really intensely and that pushes do, through vibration and weight, pushes a steel pipe down into the ground and uh, it extracts for us sediment that gets captured inside a plastic sleeve that's in this tube. All right, so here's a view of one of the things that, one of the areas where we had done coring. At the top, this is the sub-bottom profiler data that we saw. 
And so you can see there's some layers here. This, this layer that is at the surface is actually the seafloor. Then the next layer below it is a harder deposit that had a different reflection. And then below that is another reflector. So basically what we saw was this sort of thicker but fuzzy deposit. And I asked the marine geologist, why was this really interesting? And they said, well, this could be uh, fuzzy because it's, a, it's messing with the seismic data in a way that might reflect something like gas charged sediment. And I said, well, why would that matter? They go, well, it could be like a mud flat or it could be an area where there's tidal, you know, it's been exposed at low tides, let's say. So we'll see. So we put cores across here and you can see these are the cores that we found. They're a little hard to see the details, but what's important is the dark blue shows this deposition of sediment under basically a, a, a thicker water column, under a deeper water column. So this is the time, the dark blue is when essentially sea level had come up and absolutely submerged the landscape. The more lighter blue one is a deposit created under higher energy. As sea level came up, it basically created a shell gravel, this really chewed up shelly deposit that um, laid on top of the thing below it, which is the green bits are and yellow parts are basically deposits that relate to the environment before sea level came up. Now the numbers on the edges of the cores uh, are basically parts of it that relate to the timing of when these deposits were laid down. So if we move to the right, you'll see these are thousands of years ago. So we got radiocarbon ages on shells and they show us that essentially from about 16,500 to 16,700 or so, this deposit's being laid down before sea level came up. Then as sea level came up, it introduced some fossil wood and then the dates just get younger from there. So this allows us to predict where sea level, we had our model that predicted where sea level should be. And I, as I mentioned before, it's about 13,000 years, we said that area would have been exposed. And that's about right here, but let's zoom in on this to see why this is a big deal. So if we zoom in on the left-hand side is a photograph showing you what the core looks like. And you can see there's some laminated muds that are kind of cross cut with these more shelly sandy parts. The right-hand side is a CT scan. If you've ever had to go to a doctor and get a CT scan, you might see a different image, I would hope, from your own uh, you know, experience. But what we have at OSU is a veterinary college and they have a large animal CT scanner. So we just go and put these sediment cores on them and they give us images of what's inside the core. So we see the laminations, but we also see these sort of weird blobs. Well, these blobs are the burrows of invertebrates that live in different environments. So the right is what we call an ichnophases model. And ichnology is the study of essentially fossil traces of animals. So their footprints, their burrows, things like this. And we're gonna work with geologic specialists that can help interpret for us what these traces are and how they relate to very specific animals, but also parts of a landscape. They're gonna help us reconstruct that landscape. And so in the end, it could be that we're looking at something like this. We may have found the remnants of an estuary at the beginning of my talk, I mentioned how estuaries are probably the hot spot. It's where people want to hang out and do a lot of their activities and as a result, leave behind this evidence for us to find. So for our next steps in our research, we wanna keep looking at the cores, of course, that we have found or that we recovered. And I should say, we didn't pull up any artifacts that we have seen in these cores so far, but you know, it's a four inch or so diameter core. It's a really small view of this ancient landscape. I see this uh, project though as a big victory because we've been able to go from not even understanding what the landscape looked like to making a model of the landscape, validating it through our geophysical surveys, and then even being able to get parts of it and pull up and say, yes, the model that as of landscape change matches the data in terms of radiocarbon ages, but it also shows us parts of the landscape as they once were before sea level came up. So we're gonna study these cores to learn more about them. We're also gonna focus our, our search with other projects moving forward in the future for other early parts of these landscape, landscapes and intensively sample these through more coring to try to find archeological evidence if we can. And then I've only talked about a relatively small piece of the whole Oregon coast. Well, this research program can be expanded up and down Oregon's coast to build a much better understanding of this. 
And this is critical for, and I'll, I'll let my other partners talk about why they think this could be interesting, but at least for me, I think this information is really fascinating because it helps us understand this thing that we call the Lost Coast. This world that once was that undoubtedly was occupied by people and is sort of a first approach for us to begin to understand how to actually reach out and measure it. So what I want to wrap up by saying is that um, my experience working on this project has been fantastic. There's me in the middle wearing the poorly fitting uh, blue helmet hard hat here. And uh, what's important is that I come from a liberal arts background, but I have skill sets that cross over very much into the science world. And I can uh, suggest problems, think of issues that we should be studying, and I can uh, be able to work alongside other kinds of um, you know, experts that take us out on places I've ne I never probably would have gone to without being able to participate and contribute to projects like this. So I think that's one of the wonderful things about uh, the Marine Studies Initiative, that it's gonna allow students to get all these cross-disciplinary uh, activities and experiences to go out and be able to contribute to understanding our oceans and not just you know, the things that swim in the ocean now, but the things that once were, that were present before sea level came up. So I have a lot of research partners to thank with this. Um, I mentioned our federal agency partners. And um, I also wanna thank too, the, uh, the coastal tribes of Oregon. They've been uh, great uh, helpers with us and great collaborators with us. And it's been wonderful to hear perspectives from them as well as we've uh, done this project. So, so thank you very much. Thank you, Lauren. That was a great overview of looking at, uh, at Hecate Bank as someone that spent time on the top of the ocean there. I always wondered more what it looks like underneath. So what we're gonna do now is transition to the panel. Um, and then after the panels, each panelist each give a few remarks, we'll entertain your questions and try to supply some answers. So please do, please do use that Q and A function on the bottom of the Zoom, start typing those in. And now I'm gonna ask Lauren to um, introduce the panelists, maybe uh, ask them where they're from, what, what they do, and uh, to make a few remarks. So Lauren, if you'd take that away. Okay, thank you very much, Jack. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm pleased to be on a panel today uh, with another, a number of great people that I've worked with that have information to share about this kind of topic from some different perspectives. So let's just go ahead and go around uh, the group and we'll first start with uh, Stacy Scott. Please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Lauren said, my name is Stacy Scott and I am the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer and Cultural Resources Protection Specialist for the Confederated Tribes of the Coastal Rumpua and Sayusla Indians. And I have been in this role since uh, 2013 with the tribes. I've um, had the pleasure of being involved since like the early days of some of this work back in like 2014 um, with Dave Ball and uh, Noah as well. You know, we were just like working on the potential for a little pilot project for wind energy off the Oregon coast here at Coos Bay. And so that kind of, you know, sparked conversations uh, for the tribes and, and looking at like, well, can we do a better way through the section 106 process of, of looking at uh, cultural resources. So, you know, BOEM helped fund this, uh, this document, tribal cultural landscape document. Um, and at the time, you know, there was only kind of like a traditional cultural property approach and how we looked at cultural resources on, you know, more of like a terrestrial landscape. And, you know, the, the problem with traditional cultural properties, as anybody that's worked in cultural resource management knows, is that it makes you define boundaries. So you're often constrained at what you can look at. Um, tribes definitely prefer the landscape approach that we've looked at for this project um, and, and developing wind and wave energy projects off the coast. Um, you know, it, it allows the freedom for tribes to acknowledge not only the historic uses of the landscape, but, um, you know, the contemporary practices as well, because tribes are very much still, you know, part of uh, the, the story here. They've been here since time immemorial. Um, you know, this landscape approach utilizes tribal knowledge. It's been passed down for generations, and this tribal 
uh, traditional knowledge has been, I think, helpful, um, you know, with working with Lauren a little bit about looking at, you know, areas of interest for the tribes and, you know, not just looking at it from a pure scientific approach. We were able to kind of branch out and look at, you know, the traditional knowledge, um, you know, CT Clusi, for example, has a, a lot of traditional knowledge related to things from seasonality of harvesting to geologic formation of the coastal landscape um, and big geologic events such as like the 1700 Cascadia earthquake. Um, there are stories related to, you know, that earthquake in particular that talked about, you know, canoes being pushed up on top of Blue Ridge Mountain. So just thinking about the power of, of a geologic force like that. Um, you know, this type of approach is really a good collaboration between BOEM, NOAA, and OSU um, in determining those resources of significance to tribes in those areas with research potential, you know, that should be focused on during the study. Um, CT Clusi, like I said, has a special connection to this place on the Oregon coast since they've lived here since time immemorial and they consider themselves the stewards of these lands. So they appreciated, you know, being involved in collaborative collaboration with efforts um, for the study for submerged lands within their ancestral territory. And you know, they they've always continually acknowledged those submerged lands as being part of the ancestral territory. Um, you know, their their lands go out beyond the continental shelf. Um, and just because those lands are now submerged, it doesn't mean that they're of lesser significance or they're forgotten to the tribe. And like I said before, the tribes, you know, through their stories and cultural practices still recognize the fact that their ancestors once lived on those lands and that those cultural resources and sacred burial ground should be protected the same as non-submerged sites. But, you know, of course, we first have to identify where those locations are. And so scientific studies such as what Lauren has been working on to help determine where, you know, these high probability areas are located is really helpful for the tribes of protecting those resources from any future development projects such as wind and wave energy. So I'm definitely happy, happy to see the success of not only the findings of this work, but I'm also with the level of early and ongoing collaboration that's been occurring with tribes. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, it's, it's really kind of fascinating for me to think about the idea that this was a, a totally different landscape that you know, people you know, that are the ancestors of you know, today's modern day native communities would live out in this and they were the ones experiencing it. And, and also remember, we talked about the idea that as we transition from a glacial to post-glacial environment, uh, the sea, sea level would have come up. And as it did this, it would have submerged the landscape and caused an incredible amount of dynamic change that the, you know, the tribal groups of Oregon's coast have experienced the thing that we may all be experiencing you know, in the future. But I think that's something we might also talk about uh, with our other experts. So uh, why don't we put the spotlight now on Dave Ball. Dave, you want to tell us some things? Sure. Thanks, Lauren. Uh, great presentation. Uh, Dave Ball, I'm the Pacific Region Historic Preservation Officer for the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, which is a, a U.S. government agency under the Department of Interior uh, that is responsible for uh, leasing and, and regulating uh, energy and mineral uh, activities in federal waters offshore. So our jurisdiction begins about three miles offshore where state waters end and then extend roughly 200 miles offshore through the end of the exclusive economic zone. Um, I'm um, um, participating today from Ventura, California, uh, which is uh, where our, uh, here where our Pacific Region office is located in Camarillo. It's the uh, traditional homelands of the Chumash Nation. Uh, which includes both uh, federally recognized and non-recognized uh, um, tribal groups. And uh, I've been in, in the region here for 11 years now, uh, transferred out from our New Orleans office in the Gulf of Mexico um, in 2010 and had worked for about 11 years there as well. And, uh, and so we did a lot of work uh, in the Gulf of Mexico focused uh, specifically on oil and gas activity uh, and um, with the expectation, anticipation of uh, offshore renewable energy activities picking up here on the West Coast, um, I, I, I came out to, the, to this region. And uh, one of the things we've been trying to get a better understanding on is the potential for um, submerged landform features offshore that could be associated with uh, pre-contact archaeological sites. Um, 
you know, I've had an opportunity through my experience to work on a number of um, uh, underwater sites across the country, uh, both historic uh, shipwreck sites that uh, people traditionally think about with marine archaeology, but also um, submerged pre-contact sites, particularly uh, the west coast of Florida and off, off the Texas coast, where the geology is different in that area. And uh, we actually have identified, um, particularly off the eastern gulf of the west coast of Florida, um, archaic period sites at, uh, dating you know, seven, 8,000 years ago that extend out uh, several miles offshore, and, and but still within state waters. And so the dynamics in the Pacific region is a lot different. And just trying to get a better understanding of, of the potential for these submerged landform features out here, uh, we funded this, uh, some of the research that Lauren was talking about, about five years ago, we started on this effort and looking at um, both off the um, Southern California area, the, the Channel Islands, as well as the Central Oregon uh, coast, really trying to get a, a better understanding of these, uh, the potential for these sites. Uh, it's not that we're looking, for, uh, for, for BOEM's purposes anyway, we're not trying to find sites specifically, um, we're trying to find the landforms where those sites can be associated. So I like to think of it as not, we're not looking for the needle and haystack, we're trying to find the haystack first. And then once we can demonstrate that haystacks are out there, then we can start thinking about, all right, well, where would those needles be? Or where might we find those sites? And the reason that's important is because while we're looking at uh, potentially permitting uh, things like uh, wind energy uh, projects off the West Coast, uh, in federal waters, they're gonna be, for the most part, a lot deeper than the areas that would have been um, you know, subaerially exposed and have the potential for submerged pre-contact sites, but there will, there will be transmission um, uh, cables that run from those areas back to shore and therefore do have the potential for impacting the, these features. And so we want to get a better understanding of that. And so that's, that really is, is why the agency has been interested in this. And we've had, um, you know, I really appreciate the opportunity I've had to work not only with, Oregon, uh, with Lauren and Oregon State University, but the, the um, coastal tribes of Oregon as well as the, um, all the other uh, tribes along the West Coast, just trying to get a better understanding of the potential for these resources and how we can better identify them to, um, to uh, protect them in, in our permitting activities. Well, thank you very much. Um, yeah, that's, that's something I think that a lot of people don't really think about is the whole idea that, well, one, there's a lost coast, there's an ancient coastline that may have been out there, and that two, there might be archaeological sites relating to the things people do uh, in the past with this, but from a modern perspective, that you know, there's also these concerns. As you know, as a nation, we may have to manage you know resources like this, and as a result, we have to get this understanding about a, a place and a time that once was, and be able to wrap our heads around that. From a federal management point of view, I find that part really fascinating, and I have to say that there's no way we could have done the work that we talked about today if not because of the partnerships we've had with BOEM in particular and with NOAA. And because those ships I showed you, for example, are tremendously expensive to, to have out there. And most archeological budgets are not running on that scale. So it's a totally different world and it's been fascinating to be involved. So we're gonna hear next from Dr. Tom Royer. Go ahead, Tom. Yeah, I'm a physical oceanographer, and if anybody told me that uh, when I started make, making temperature and salinity measurements in the northern Gulf of Alaska, that I'd be participating in an anthropology uh, seminar in years down the road, I would say, say they were nuts. But um, I do have some information about uh, early Americans that, uh, that uh, paddled down from from the, the Bering Sea um, against the Alaska coastal current that was uh, that was trying that was flowing northward up into the Bering Sea, um, but at the height of the uh, the ice age at the uh, last glacial maximum, there was very little fresh water coming into the Gulf of Alaska. Right now, we have about uh, something. <clears throat> about one and a half times the Mississippi River flowing into the Gulf of Alaska's fresh water that goes around the Gulf into the Bering Sea. 
And if that was flowing when they were trying to paddle their skin boats down the coast, it would have been very, very difficult. But uh, at the height of the Ice Age, uh, most of all of the pre precipitation was tied up as snow, um, and there was very little runoff. So uh, they, it, it was an easy time for a few thousand years they could get down to the coast. And that was about 16,000 years ago. And then about uh, 14,500 years ago, the, there was a glacial, there, there was a global warming, and that started uh, melting the glaciers uh, quite rapidly. And um, it, uh, so it, it accelerated the flow. So it was uh, about two to three times uh, fast, faster than the present flow in the Alaska coastal current. So they would have had difficulty um, paddling their skin boats down to, uh, to the Pacific Northwest. So there was a hiatus between uh, about uh, 15,000 years ago and maybe 11,000 years ago where they couldn't make it down. So we have a situation where you know, the, the DNA um, profiles, historic DNA profiles, show um, sort of a hiatus you know, that matches up with a very strong Alaska coastal current. So that <clears throat> the other thing, <clears throat> excuse me, the other thing I want to mention is that the shelf in, off the Gulf, in, in the Gulf of Alaska looked uh, somewhat different than the, the shelf that uh, is off Oregon in that uh, the the uh, the weight of the glaciers um, like uh, 20 to 25,000 years ago pushed down um, the uh, the land um, and there was a four bulge so that uh, you could have had some uh, some dry land offshore um, of where where we have it now sort of out at the con edge of the continental shelf and that might be a place to look for um, artifacts um, uh, if, if they exist. They, they might be at the edge of the continental shelf that's now under maybe a, uh, 150 or 200 meters of water. So I'll, I'll leave it there and open it for questions. Okay, well, thanks, Tom. Um, you know, uh, I was always interested in knowing more about the ancient environment of the coastline you know obviously the work that we've done in Oregon relates to that and but most of what we've talked about so far with the work that I have been participating in is just sort of like physical changes how the landscape changes due to lowering and rising sea level but there's all these other things that of course we have to factor in and this is the part that I always try to tell my students about is that in the end, archeology span is sort of about everything. That is, you have to wonder about like, well, not only is the landscape different, but how did ocean circulation change during an ice age? How might that have affected people? Like what are sort of the implications of all these different environmental situations? And one thing I didn't really spend any time pointing out much is that if you lower sea level uh, out and get this extra, you know, territory off of Oregon's coast, this sort of projection off of the central coast, that huge projection would have had a big influence even on oceanic circulation, at least along the coastline. So we could get absolutely different sort of environmental uh, things going on there too, I would imagine. Um, but I find that whole concept fascinating that there's sort of these windows of time when there's opportunities and constraints. And if you're gonna move down or work around an environment next to ice, well, it's fine as long as the ice is staying put and not melting. But as soon as that stuff melts, you know, the idea that it would be a multiple scales of, you know, energy higher than the Mississippi, that's just really fascinating to think about. Yeah, e even now it's uh, about 1.5 times the Mississippi River, uh, the freshwater going into the Gulf of Alaska. Um, and and dur during the height of the melting at the end of the last ice age, it was probably three or four times that. Yeah, so so that's really, again, another part of this whole thing that's really amazing to me from an anthropology point of view is thinking about 
humans, that is people living in these coastal environments will look very different than today, have very different climatic situations, very different oceanic situations perhaps. And also too, you know, some of these coastal rivers of Oregon that aren't that huge become very big. As you give them more land to run across, they start to converge and become bigger and bigger order streams. And so there's just a lot of things that are different about the past. And in archeology, span we think about this as a non-analogous environment. That is, it's very difficult to understand it from where we're standing now. So we have to use transdisciplinary perspectives in order to you know, lean on you know, a marine geologist or lean on a, a marine biologist or someone who specializes in the burrows and mud. And all together as a team, we can help understand what this world was a lot more like. So um, anyway, I think that's sort of a, a really nice roundup and perspective from a lot of our, uh, from, from all of our panel members. So uh, Jack, why don't I go ahead and throw the ball back to you now? Sure. So Lauren, I'd just like to go ahead into the, the question and answer period. And you might want to introduce Sam as a, as a student here at Oregon State, if you'd like to do that. Yep, for sure. Um, Samantha Stone is going to be working with us. She's an undergraduate in anthropology. Uh, and also she studies sustainability as part of her education at OSU. And Sam has come out in the field with me and worked on projects from Western Idaho to Baja California. And um, she's gonna be helping out today with us to uh, field your questions and uh, make sure we get all the things you're wondering about answered. Okay, yeah. So we're gonna get started with the Q&A session now. Um, we've been collecting your questions as they've come in. So the first one is directed at Lauren. If you find an archeological site located in deep water, say 100 meters below sea level, will you be able to excavate the site by using scuba gear? That's a great question. So that's a one that gets asked a lot, you know, would we just simply do what we do above sea level, but just do it below sea level? Um, well, the, the short answer is no, because 100 meters below sea level is tremendously deep. You have to have extremely specialized equipment and training to work at that kind of depth. And that's not something or a place, you know, that I would ask Sam Stone to go down and excavate, uh, you know, uh, an excavation unit for me at the bottom of the seafloor. So, so instead what we would end up doing would be using some of the tools that I've already shown. We would have to use ship-based platforms in order to lower equipment to the seafloor. Um, you know, in my own imagination, I can come up with solutions like if we had a remotely operated vehicle that had able hands, we could drive it maybe to do an excavation. But, you know, some of the things we've seen so far is that the sediments we're interested in exploring are going to be buried beneath a pretty thick cover of marine deposits that, that accumulated since sea level came up. So it's really not that, you know, likely that we're going to even maybe use an ROV to do a digging for us like that. We're probably going to use coring. Coring would be probably the best way for us to do that. Plus the nice thing is that you bring up, you know, this big sample that's in a vertically stacked tube. So we can read the record from top, which is youngest to the bottom, which is oldest. And we can have a, a physical record to compare. So. And I just, I'd add to that Lauren, um, having worked on some deep water sites in the Gulf of Mexico, um, you know, if we were to try to excavate a, a pre-contact site here off the, the West Coast, in that sort of depth that would probably be carried. So coring is definitely gonna be um, uh, you know, one of the best methodologies there. Uh, so it's, it's gonna be ship-based, but there is uh, also some information you can probably help capture um, with the ROVs, um, you know, just getting a better idea of the surface, if, uh, you know, what the surface looks like. Uh, you know, we've, we've used uh, technology like that on shipwreck sites to, uh, you know, collect uh, fragile glass and ceramic artifacts. Uh, you just you, you can tool up these are these remotely operated vehicles uh, for whatever the mission is. Uh, and so, if you're looking for something a little closer to the surface, that would certainly be a great tool. Uh, you can add uh, geophysical uh, survey equipment to those uh, to those ROVs also, so that they can do tighter um, surveys on the seafloor than you might be able to get uh, from the sensors on the ship or use something like an autonomous underwater vehicle 
where um, that would also have different uh, geophysical sensors like the subbody profiler, um, uh, bathymetry, or even video cameras on it, and uh, just uh, program it with a, a pre designed survey to go out and, and mow the lawn, but a, a, even a tighter uh, uh, lane spacing than, than you can accomplish with, with the surface vessel. So it is it's possible, but uh, you certainly want, you want some diagrams. Yeah, I, I don't think that that would be a great a great time being on the bottom. What is the? Let me ask you this, though, Dave. What's the deepest that you've ever worked doing an underwater excavation? Um, so the deepest underwater excavation was in about uh, forty five hundred feet of water, and perhaps a shipwreck site. Uh, the deepest diving I've done was about two hundred fifty feet of water, and that does take a lot of extra equipment. Uh, we have a different uh, gas mixture. And uh, it was about a two and a half hour dive, but the amount of time on the bottom was about 20 minutes. Wow, that's incredible. That would be amazing. So, yeah. Uh, and you mentioned autonomous vehicles. I've always had this dream that someday autonomous vehicles will be developed to such complexity that I'll just, you know, get up in the morning with my cup of coffee and look at my screen and in the night, the robot has flown to the surface and pings me all the new data of all the sites it's found somewhere offshore. So if there's any of you clever students out there that want to develop a really cool project, it, that would be it. So make us the Archeo robot. That's not really that far off. I mean, they're using um, autonomous surface vehicles now that can either um, you know, mow the lawn on the surface itself or can actually dive down to uh, whatever depth is and collect samples. And so it does kind of a, you know, wave pattern up and down. Uh, the AEVs, of course, you know, those work. But um, with some of the work we've done with NOAA and the um, uh, scientists at CEDIA, uh, the RVs, if they have telepresence, you know, they actually have some of us on kind of speed dial. So if they find something out there, uh, they can call us and say, hey, get, on, get online to this, you know, give us the link. And then we can actually see live video feeds from the ship and help direct the mission as, as it's going on out there. Well, that's cool stuff. Sam, why don't you give us another question? The next question is directed at Stacy. They asked, how have tribes been engaged throughout this study? Yeah, so, um, you know, many tribes, like I said, we, we kind of started having conversations through like the kind of the wind float pilot project discussion back in 2014, um, you know, with the development of the uh, TCL document, the Tribal Cultural Landscape document. Um, I know myself, I've, I've been uh, attending numerous meetings and I've had a lot of collaboration with BOEM, NOAA, and OSU, you know, trying to look at identification of areas to focus on for the study. Um, a lot of uh, traditional ecological knowledge was utilized, um, as well as some of the preliminary studies that, that Lauren had kind of touched on. So there was a lot of, um, you know, good data out there that we're able to use in a good collaborative way with our partners. And, um, you know, there's those continued discussions and additional studies, you know, it's like, what other things can we try to utilize uh, current technology in that to try to help identify or narrow down some of these high probability areas of interest? Um, you know, one of them was kind of like looking at the eDNA has kind of come up as, a, as another type of uh, a study that we could utilize. Um, you know, tribal members and, and representatives were also invited out on a couple of the cruises. They were able to participate in coring survey work um, also with some of the laboratory analysis work, I know we sent a tribal member who got to spend some time um, in the core lab. And I personally got to tour Lauren's awesome core lab. I was kind of jealous about that, um, his setup. So I just have like a little basic lab, but he's got this really fantastic lab. Uh, so I was really happy to, to get a chance to see that. And, you know, we're just continuing to be involved in collaboration and continue to work through this research with OSU and, and BOEM and continuing to have good consultation and coordination meetings with BOEM related to the future of offshore wind and wave energy projects. Um, this next question is from Liz Parati, directed at Lauren. Is there an appropriate material for isotope analysis to determine diet or other information 
through the shells from the middens you found in cores? Uh, so, so in in relation to sort of figuring out diet, um, you know, one way to, to do this is to measure, you know, the isotopes of something like, you know, the human remains. But you know, there's a lot of sensitivity, of course, around human remains that we find in archaeological sites, and when they are found, we work very carefully with the coastal tribes uh, right off the bat. And in a lot of cases, you know, it's not necessarily decided that any kind of, let's say, destructive work would want to go on to measure something like that. The flip side of this is that we can also just simply look at the food remains that are in a midden, let's say, that is the things that were left behind, and they can inform for us the dietary aspects of people. So you don't necessarily have to do a destructive analysis of bone, let's say, to figure that out. You can just simply look at the food remains that were left behind by people, and it's an indirect measure of that as well. So um, I think what uh, in, Stacy mentioned this, this whole concept of eDNA, and that is called environmental DNA. And one of the ways that we can try to reconstruct what the environment was like at any one time is to actually pull DNA that's sticking to sediments that are then buried and we can find them in a core. So there are specialists now that can amplify and decode and tell us the presence and absence of different kinds of plants and animals that are offshore because it's only we have a pretty limited view with this core, but there could be an incredible amount of DNA that's in that, let's say, an estuary that's accumulating in the mud, and we can core it. So, so that's sort of another way that we can we can measure that. This next question is from Edward Dever. Could sheltering within Paleo Hecate Bay have helped preserve some of the sediments there from wave action? I guess I can answer this. So this is uh, there's a place, there's some places offshore now of Oregon known as these banks, that is the Hasita Bank, the Stonewall Bank, Perpetua Bank, and these are rocky um, formations that today host a lot of different kinds of fishes that hang around on that more complex environment. And at lower sea level, these would have formed a low mountain range chain that would have created this embayment on the other, the east side of it. And so uh, I would expect that sedimentation would be absolutely different on the inside. And this is something we think about as archaeologists, that it's not enough to have a place for people to hang out and, you know, leave behind evidence. That evidence has to be buried. And then it has to be buried in a way it's going to preserve later in time. So as sea level comes up, we really don't want it to be too exposed because it might get erased, as, you know, we were talking about early on. But the other problem is that these are also zones where there's lower energy, so more sediment does accumulate. So it becomes very really hard for us sometimes to actually to see it, a buried landform, but also to measure it. So next time you're on the Oregon coast and you're in the town of Florence or Dune City, uh, note that there's these really big piles of sand all around you. Well, the reason for this is because the central Oregon coast, this map I showed you, was a really big platform that today is accumulating sand as the currents push material around up and down the coast. At low sea level, all that sand gets exposed and the wind is relentless and it pushes that stuff inland and accumulates just to the east of this platform. So there you go. If you learn nothing else today, that's why the dune sands are there in Florence. Um, this next question is asking what size core can be collected? What size core can be collected? Well, you know, um, I'm going to ask Dave to perhaps answer this. I'm not a big expert on all the things that can be done. He has a lot more experience. So typically when we're coring offshore, we're looking at the three or four inch diameter core. Um, and that has to do with the, the weight of things, uh, just you know, the, the dynamics of the, of the environment that we're working in. The, um, that's the, instrumentation we're using. So it's, it's typically a three or four inch core. Um, I believe the core has been collected uh, of work with three inch grit board. Yeah, they're three inch. So um, of course you would want to try to get the biggest core you possibly could, but you know there's some serious problems with this because you one have to be able to push a larger diameter pipe into the seafloor and you have to be able to push it down far enough to reach. And a three inch core was actually challenging for us to push down 
more than let's say, you know, two to three meters. That was a really good push if we could get past two meters. Um, but in a lot of cases, that's a problem. Plus um, the Roger Ravel ship I mentioned was really critical because we had to be able to sit over our core when it was stuck in the seafloor. We had to be able to sit there and pull the thing up vertically. Because if you drift off station and you start to pull at an angle, bad things can happen. And so you can snap the line, you can lose equipment stuck into the seafloor. That, that's exactly the thing we do not want to happen. But that's Tom, exactly Tom, can you, what's that, Dave? Sorry. Just saying that's exactly the thing that did happen with us off the Northern Channel Islands uh, before we moved to, to the Oregon coast. Uh, we were not fortunate to have a dynamically positioned vessel. Um, we were using it uh, just, you know, a ship that uh, was trying to stay on station as best it could and uh, drifted off and they ended up snapping the line for the fiber core and it sat on the bottom for about a year or so and then we went back out on a subsequent cruise and were able to um, uh, for grappling off, hook off the side basically and then do a giant circle around the area to grab the fiber core which fortunately did uh, hook onto it and retrieve it that way. Um, then we uh, got it cleaned up and used it off the Oregon coast. Well, there you go. You know, you lose something really important on the bottom of the seafloor, ask an archaeologist. They, they can, they're really good at finding stuff. So, um, <laughs> so there was a question earlier, Tom, about the size of cores that can be, you know, easily removed or sampled the seafloor. We always want the biggest sample we can get, but what's sort of like the functional limits of coring? I, I, I think that the, uh, the limits are on the order of uh, 20 to 40 meters, something like that. Um, it depends on the, the uh, density of the, of the sediment, of course. Um, but um, the, some of the cores that, uh, that we've been looking at go back uh, at least uh, 16,000 years. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Sam? Um, this next question is directed at Tom from Bob Diziak. Has Cobb Seamount been surveyed as a potential offshore waypoint for human migration? Yeah, I'm, I'm not understanding the question, sorry. So the question is about a seamount called Cobb Seamount. Oh, and okay. whether or not it's been surveyed for uh, archaeological content, perhaps. Okay. Yeah. Um, I I don't think that it has for archaeological content. Um, it, as, as you well know, it it takes uh, something other than just core to to get uh, to obtain some things of archaeological significance. Um, uh, I, I, I would assume that the Cobb Seamount has been, uh, has had some cores taken on it, but uh, I don't, don't know any um, archeological evidence. Okay, thanks. Sam? Um, this next question is from John Chapman. I presume that estuary middens have particular mixes of bivalves to do to selection that are different from bivalve populations in general. Is that what you are looking for? Well, when we were imaging some of these things, we would see different density layers and we thought, well, maybe these could be a shell midden. But the other problem is that there's a lot of shellfish in the ocean, it turns out. And a lot of these accumulate in deposits that really have nothing to do with people. So you can get natural accumulation to shell also. So the big concern is, of course, we didn't want to somehow, you know, incorrectly identify a layer of shell as an archaeological site. So it would probably require more than just the discovery of shell for us to make the determination that it was archaeological. We would, ideally, we'd like to see an artifact, you know, something that was undeniably made by people. That would really help. Um, in some cases, you know, maybe you might try to make an argument about the array of different species together or Another thing that would be interesting is to find terrestrial animal remains, let's say mixed in with marine shell. That would be hard to explain as you know, accumulating offshore. But 
that's really not as good as finding an artifact. Sort of from the perspective of poker, I guess you might say, shells alone are something like a two, you know, as your high card. Whereas finding artifacts that somebody carved it very obviously, it's really obviously an artifact mixed in with other shells, that's a royal flush that really will help you. Okay, the next question is asking, how did Midden survive the numerous tsunamis over the last 3,000 years? Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, that's a good one. It really depends on where the midden is positioned in the landscape. You know, in some cases, the, the tsunami effect would just simply be to bury things. That is, the ocean comes in, it brings a whole layer of sand in, it can cap and bury things. Um, in some cases, it might be very destructive, I suppose. I imagine that in these cores that we've taken offshore, we may uh, if we don't have it already, we may ultimately find evidence of tsunamis that were affecting the outer coast as it was at a lower position. So that's something to think about. That engine that works offshore, the, the Cascadia subduction zone is relentless. You know, it's been going far longer than people have been around, um, probably at least to experience it, or maybe, you know, from time immemorial, at least they've been allowed as long as people have been here, let's say it that way. So, um, so, I don't know. Any of our other panelists, do you have any perspectives on how we might measure tsunamis and what they might do to the record? I mean, here in, in Hoop Bay, with some of the work that has been done, we've seen some subsidence areas um, that's evidence from, you know, tree saplings still present, and those are directly adjacent to midden sites. So we will have a midden site that's still above. Um, high tide areas, and they date to the same time period as now these subsided areas um, to around 3,000 years here in Coos Bay. And so, you know, I think some of it might have to do with some of the subduction plates and how they're moving around. Um, I think there are a lot of them, there is evidence with a lot of uh, sedimentation coming on top of them and then being buried uh, so I think all of those those factors come into play a little bit with how they're being protected when a tsunami wave comes in. Okay, the next quest question asks, do any of the sediments show evidence of eDNA related to terrestrial organisms? Well, we haven't measured that quite yet. We're still in discussions with all of our partners about the best ways to move forward with that and if that's something that everyone wants to do. Uh, so that could happen in a next phase. But um, the, you know, the other answer to that is we're not really sure because no one is really entirely certain if uh, DNA will preserve very well in our part of the world. Because a lot of the places where this has been very successful so far have been in more northern latitudes where colder conditions have helped to preserve DNA. So it could be possible that it's there, but we don't know yet. Um, the next question is directed at Tom. How were ocean currents near the coast different 10,000 years ago or more compared with present day? How might that have affected travel by boat along the coast? I, I think 10,000 years ago, they were, <clears throat> It could have been very similar to what we have now. Um, the, during during the height of the ice age, of course, the, there was no very little fresh water coming in, and so there was very little uh, motion, water motion, northward along the coast. So that uh, if if they were coming down in boats along the coast, it would be a pretty easy paddling. Um, when when we got when af, after the uh, last glacial maximum, um, with the increased um, warming, there would be a lot more storms, so that uh, there would it would be much more difficult to uh, to come down the coast because of the storms and the current going against the uh, the people in the boats. All right, the next question is directed at Stacy. 
Um, how is information on submerged landforms helpful to tribes for the protection of cultural resources um, under the National Historic Preservation Act? Yeah, so, you know, for tribes, I guess the, the statement that most tribes say is that, you know, consultation is key and early and often um, consultation is, is best. So, you know, if we're already looking at, you know, these submerged landforms off the coast, um, it's already started a conversation um, with some of our, our federal agency partners, such as BOEM and NOAA. And so, you know, whenever we have proposed development coming in, um, it's automatically, you know, triggering this conversation earlier in the process about, you know, how to engage the tribes and what the tribes interests might be for the presence of cultural resources. And so, um, you know, this, this work is really trying to understand those high probability areas um, off of the, the coast and, you know, the need to do additional surveys, you know, or additional studies such as the eDNA stuff to kind of assist with like better understanding those areas and, and the presence of people on the landscape. And so that kind of gets at, you know, that consultation piece and that early conversation through the Section 106 process that, you know, federal agencies have to do with tribes is consult with them about potential impacts to culture resources. And so, you know, in the past, there's been a lot of focus on more of the terrestrial landscape and not really looking at submerged sites and so, or wet sites. And so I think the, the popular trend has been um, for a lot of agency just kind of to check the box that, you know, there's, there's cultural resources surveyed um, more along the lines of like historic shipwrecks or historic era sites and not so much with these pre-contact sites. So, you know, it's just a formality of, you know, we did a, a SHPO search or we contacted, you know, a representative from an agency such as BOEM about shipwrecks and, you know, there's none noted in the area moving on. So now this at least, you know, engages tribes in a meaningful and appropriate way um, to have that conversation about cultural resources of significance to tribes, um, understanding where those like areas might be of significance um, so that we can move forward in a good way. Um, the next question asks, have phosphorus levels or other chemical markers that might indicate human occupation been considered? So, yeah, as people live in a landscape and they they throw away, let's say, food remains or, you know, uh, do the things that everyone does and maybe go to the bathroom or something, you can put chemical markers into the ground that could be measured. But the problem is, is there's a little bit of overlap, of course, between all the other natural sources of these chemicals. So it's a kind of a blunt tool for us to be able to just simply say nitrogen levels are high or phosphorus levels are high that must mean people were present. So, so that's a tough one for us. And, and, and again, with the analogy of poker, that's a pair of twos, maybe, you know, it's, it's not, not a great kind of way to argue about it. So in the end, you know, we're having to be very careful about this because we, we need also too to have the level of credibility about, if you're gonna say there's archeological presence somewhere, you have to really be able to demonstrate it uh, in a way for people, so. Um, this next question is from Robert Lackey. Based on this or other studies, what is known about changes to the size of salmon runs over the centuries? With more estuaries along the Oregon coast, presumably some species would do better. Uh, I'll just say something brief about that and then I'm interested to hear what other people have to say. But uh, I would think that under lower sea level with this different landscape with lots of other uh, river channels being present in bigger and bigger scales, then you would have other environmental aspects like salmon streams might have been more, you know, abundant. And, you know, a stream that's small today that has salmon, let's say like the Alsea River, for example, there are salmon that come in the Alsea, but under lower sea level, it would have been probably a much bigger attractant and have bigger salmon runs, I, I would imagine. So how you measure that, I'm not sure exactly, but uh, that's something to consider. Um, other people, what, what do you think about this idea? I think my answer was so good. No one wants to follow up on that. So, <laughs> so Sam, why don't you go ahead and um, maybe let's 
go one or two more questions perhaps, or well, let's see where we're going. Uh, Jack, any, any perspective? How are we doing on our time and questions? Yeah, I think that I think you're right, Lauren. We probably have one or two more. I, Sam, I was wondering if I could ask a question. Go for it. So, uh, Lauren, we've been staring at your nice background there for a little while with the haystack rocks and the, and the headland there. And actually, why don't you say something and it'll, it'll come right back on. Okay, yes, here it is. Nice landscape where I'm, as you can probably so, guess, I'm so not, not actually here. So you're standing on the ancient, um, the location of present day coastline, but in ancient times, and you're looking offshore towards the Hecata Bank pinnacles. Just paint us that picture. Are they sharp, tall, haystack rocks, pinnacles like that, or what, what did it look like? Well, I've always imagined that, you know, when you're actually, the place to me that probably seems really reasonable would be something close to Florence, whereas you have a lot of dunes and then in between the dunes you have you know streams that are winding around making marshes and wetlands as they try to make their way through the maze of sand out to the ocean and but i think also too some of these larger streams would have cut more you know aggressive channels through them so not only would you just see these big headlands in the distance as prominent landforms but you'd have landscapes that were sort of rising up to them probably sandbanks sort of going up to them it would have been a very different environment than today. That is, we don't have really big coastal plains on Oregon. We have a very narrow coastline that goes right up against the edge of, you know, essentially the coast range. So, so when you're at the coast, you know, next time you're there at the coast, imagine that where you're standing was a really far distance inland. You were in sort of the upper reaches of these watersheds, and this is just now the part that's left behind. And so standing at the coast 10,000 years ago, if we were at the modern coast, this would have been a place that people would have to have walked a long distance inland to get to. And that can be the challenge for why it's hard for us to find sites that are older than, let's say, 3,000 years or so, because all the action is out there to the west. Everyone wants to be out there where all that great, you know, marine resources are and all these other things. And surely there would have been reasons to come inland. It's just that you're not going to stay in that place that long and make a big mess. It's hard to find it archaeologically. Thanks for that. Sam, were there any more that you had teed up? Um, we have about four questions left. Okay, why don't, we, uh, why don't we take two more and then we'll wrap up so you get to choose. Okay. Um, well, the next one queued up is for Dave. Um, how far offshore does Oregon's Lost Coast extend? Well, I think that one slides that Warren had her mind, you know, a good example of the farther reaches of it, the more bleak it was at this point. We don't know exactly. Based on what we're modeling and, and some work Warren's done for, uh, for us in particular, uh, we can probably 35 miles or so. Uh, um, uh, you know, the, the coast across the entire west is, is um, a lot more dynamic than it is, say, in the Gulf of Mexico, for example, uh, where you know, the west coast of Florida, um, it would have been much, much farther, I'm sure, about 60, about 70, miles um, But here, you know, the widest part, probably 35, 40. And then in different areas, it doesn't even extend into federal waters. Uh, and some, some uh, locations off the California coast, it, uh, because it just drops so fast that it doesn't really work. Yeah, so just to follow up, um, yeah, basically our coastline would have ex been extended to about 35 miles out to the west. But then as you go north and south of the central coast, because of the way the tectonics are and the geologic history of our state are set up, you have very narrow continental shelf areas relative to the central coast. So like you go down toward Bandon, for example, the extra coastline that would have been present all the way to the height of the last ice age was maybe something along the line of like 12 to 14 miles maybe or less. So, and then as you mentioned, you go down to Southern California, the shelf is really quite narrow compared to uh, Oregon. And the reason, um, and that's also the reason why the surfing is better 
in Southern California because the waves break bigger, closer to the shoreline than in Oregon. If you've ever noticed, the waves are, seem to be breaking and breaking way out there to the west. And that's just because of the shape of the continental shelf. Um, this next question is for Tom. Where might we find the artifacts that were left 16,000 years ago in the Gulf of Alaska? I, I think that a, a prime area to look is near the edge of the continental shelf. Um, because that would have been uplifted with the glaciers and that might have been where they hauled out. It's a little bit different than in Oregon because, uh, because the, we had that uh, four bulge uplift in, in front of the glaciers and uh, there could have been dry land, say, a uh, hundred miles offshore from the present. So that's, that, that's where I would look. Um, and our last question, um, this one is from Rebecca Fuller. In a lecture by Todd Brahe last fall, he mentioned a possibility of conducting environmental DNA research on marine sediments pulled from the Channel Islands investigations. Would you consider attempting that on organ cores? Are there types of analysis that you can use to infer archeological or anthropological information from those sediments? Yeah, yeah I, we would consider doing this. You know, we need to do this in collab collaboration and cooperation with all of our other partners. Um, so, so as we do this work and if we decide as a group that's something that you know, people are interested in doing together, we will. Um, and I think if DNA is present in these deposits that it could be found. Uh, and the techniques are available now to not only to extract them, but to amplify them and make these identifications quite quite readily. So, you know, the number of studies that now use this as a tool to measure the presence and absence of different animals and plants have just exploded in the last decade or so. They're really quite common now. Great. So thank you, Sam, for uh, teeing up all those questions and uh, participating with us. And so I'd just like to thank all the panelists and uh, just pause a second and ask Lauren if you had any concluding remarks and then we'll wrap up. Yeah, for sure. So thank you very much. I appreciate uh, MSI hosting this event. I think it's a really great example of the kinds of perspectives we can get that relate to problems that sort of go outside the traditional realm of you know marine studies or oceanography, for example. But again, the study of people in a place like a changing coastline in Oregon really requires a lot of different voices and perspectives. And, and not just the scientists either, either. We heard also too that you know, tribal perspectives are of course very important. And I'm really happy that we had so many great questions from people. I really appreciate that people have so much interest in these topics. And next time you're out at the Oregon coast and you're standing out looking at the West, remember that there's a lost coast out there and it looks a lot different than today. Great. Thank you, Lauren. And thanks to everyone and to Virginia and Eric for helping with the technical details. And uh, I'm sure we can applaud and uh, enjoy this early fine evening here in Oregon. And uh, see you next time for the next Marine Studies event. Again, thanks for joining us. Bye-bye.